again. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have some really, really great guests, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation about an extremely important topic. For the past few years, we've been hosting several sessions explicitly devoted to mental health on campus. COVID was one of the causes of that, as were other factors, including changes to politics, as well as changing expectations of campus services. And we've been also seeing this theme of mental health stretch across all of our other sessions, everything from what we're talking about climate change to professional development to publication even. And now I'm really grateful to have some really, really good speakers, some people who can speak to us and listen to us about mental health on campus. Uh, we have three of them, including uh, a, a guest who all of you loved last time. And I want to bring them up on stage one by one. So let's begin uh, with uh, Stephanie Moore, who is a professor at the University of New Mexico. And greetings, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. Glad to have so many folks here. Oh, it's good to see you. Thank you for coming. Good to see you too. Listen, Stephanie, um, we introduce ourselves in a futuristic way here on the forum. We ask people what they're working on for the next year. So I I'm curious, what, what projects, what classes, what publications, but, but also what ideas are you most looking forward to for the next year? Um, yeah, most of it right now. So I, I've been doing quite a bit of work really on um, ethics and educational technology for a long time now. Yeah. And one of the things that has been on my hot seat for a long time is that um, we have not really situated accessibility in context of learning theories um, in particular. Uh, we talk oh. a lot about accessibility, yeah. but I think we need to do a much better job theorizing that and, and then testing designs that we might develop around, um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, multimedia or whatever, and actually be able to answer the question, well, did we make it more accessible? And, and what does that really mean? So that's yeah. a big initiative. And then I'm, I'm going to be establishing an ethics and learning design lab here. And then probably just always continuing all the work on online learning and, and some work around adult learning and adult literacy as, as components to that too. Wow. Well, I know. Fantastic. Um, Never stay still here. <laughs> uh, I, I benefit from your work in general, but if if you have any oh, article God. or presentation about theorizing educational technology in terms of accessibility coming up, please let me know. I, I teach a class in ed tech, and I'm looking for good readings on accessibility. And I, I usually end up pointing people to the uh, Universal Design for Learning website. Yeah. Straight, but I, I would I would love to see more. Yeah, I'm happy to do that because I'm I'm even going to be trying to resurrect some behaviorism <laughs> with that, which is a bit oh. of a dirty word for a yes. lot of people. But Audrey, I think there's so much that we've you. really drawn. Yeah, so wow, great. Happy well, to I'll, share. Oh, I'm I'm so glad to hear. I'll say, well, here, let me bring <laughs> your colleagues and co-conspirators up on stage as well. Sure. Hang on one second. So uh, now I'd like to add uh, to the stage Fatema Marsban. Um, did, did I totally destroy your name? I'm sorry, Fatima. No, it's totally correct. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Ah. You can call me Fatima. <laughs> ah, brava. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. So what are you going to be working on for the next year, Fatima? Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, in having me for this panel. Of course. And, uh, as you know, I'm in a dissertation stage right now. Wow. So <laughs> my focus would be in my uh, my research area for dissertation, which is about mental fatigue and the uh, one part that is actually caused for mental fatigue, which is task in interactivity. Uh, oh. One of task attributes um, that we found as a source of mental fatigue for uh, students in online higher education. So. And there was there is a gap for that one in literature review that we couldn't find mm -hmm. more yeah. related uh, a study on this one specifically Excellent. for mental fatigue. So I uh, chose this um, area for my dissertation, and uh, I will work on it, and um, of course continue working on my other part of uh, research for mental fatigue as I will, uh, part, uh, will present one of my another uh, paper for mental fatigue indicators uh, in ARA. And I am writing, uh, I'm writing a paper on mental fatigue and its sources and 
how we can measure for online learn higher education. Oh, that sounds essential, Fatima. Yeah. I, I, I would, I mean, I think everybody involved in teaching online is going to need to know about this. So mm -hmm. I, this is this is essential work. And and if, if I could just just for a second say, first of all, thank you for coming. I'm really really glad. Thank but you for everybody, <laughs> well, this is my pleasure because one of the things we do on the forum is we like to celebrate people from all levels of career paths. So we've, we've hosted retired scholars who are fantastic resources, but also early career people, because then we can say, oh, Fatima Marsban, I knew her back then, <laughs> um, which is great, which is what we love doing. Um, and oh, I, I'm sure everybody here on this call will be delighted to give you all kinds of advice about your dissertation. I'm going to try and hold back, um, but, I, so, but we, we need to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me add your colleague. Let me add your colleague. Hello, Karen Costa. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Where, are we <laughs> Where is this? Where am I? I'm in Massachusetts, as always. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't venture out much, y'all. All right. Well, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot going on. Um, Stay home or it's safe. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me back, Brian. I appreciate it. I like to surround myself with people who are much smarter than me. And um, my, my fellow panelists here are evidence of that. So I'm excited to learn from them. Well, you are all three excellent. Um, and th th let me ask Karen again, what are you working on for the next year? What's, uh, what's top of mind for you? I am, uh, I'm, I'm not just saying this because Greg is here. Um, I'm working on a book, a second book um, about supporting our ADHD learners. So um, with Johns Hopkins University Press. So my deadline um, is later this year and I'm making fantastic progress. Don't worry. Um, so I'm really, <laughs> I'm really excited. Um, I, I just scheduled an interview uh, with Rowan University in New Jersey. They have a neurodiversity center. And Ooh. we're seeing more of these neurodiversity centers focused on the broad um, picture of neurodiversity on campus and supporting neurodivergent learners. Um, and I'm really excited to, to learn with them and to include that in the book. Uh, thank you for telling me. I'm actually going to visit that campus later this month. So. Oh, uh, my gosh. Well, that's a sign. It's all, things are coming it's all connected. Yes, 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 yes. Well, it's great to see you. And, and here, let, let me arrange things. Friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, I like to uh, change the uh, setup here so that people can exist in different parts of the screen. Uh, I'm going to ask our guests a couple of questions to get things rolling. But this forum is all about you. And I would love to hear what your questions are. So both as they speak and as they describe their thinking and their work uh, about mental health, resilience and, on, in academia, Think about what you'd like to learn more about. Uh, so I, 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 I'd like to put one question to all of you right now, um, which is how are campuses doing at trying to cultivate and support resilience? I, I, I hear resilience as a theme everywhere. It seems to be a word that you can't be against. I mean, uh, no one wants to be anti-resilient. Right? But, <laughs> but Brian, don't speak too soon. <laughs> But there's, but there's, there's, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no palatable antonym for that that we can say, right? You know, uh, I want to be brittle. You know, it doesn't quite, doesn't quite you know, have these. <laughs> how, what are, how are we doing in supporting that kind of resilience? Um, and what are we doing to support resilience? Karen's already laughing at me. She gets to go first. Yeah. So um, I laughed because I. I, I suppose I'm known as somebody who uh, gets a little fired up at what I see misuse of the term resilience. Um, so, you know, and a lot of folks know a lot of my background is in trauma informed education. So what I see are a lot of people using resilience as like an individual um, encouragement, be resilient, be resilient, um, often to deflect from um, you know, social or systemic solutions. Um, what I know about resilience is that it is a natural part of our humanity and that it blooms in the face of appropriate support and correct care. So I encourage people rather than telling individuals to be resilient, rather than telling our students to be resilient, 
let's design systems of support and get our students access to correct care in order right. to let their their natural resilience then bloom. What would be an example of such a mechanism of support? Um, you know, I use the term correct care a lot. So correct care would look like, um, and I, I just, I do want to clarify here. I'm not a clinician. I'm an, I'm an educator. Um, mm -hmm. And I am someone with lived experience with mental illness. So I want to put those two things out there. So correct care looks like getting our students access to psychiatrists, psychologists, and primary care physicians who can help manage, help them manage their mental illness. Um, so in the, in the face of, you know, getting correct care, students naturally are going to bloom, um, that resilience is going to bloom within them. When we deny students access to correct care and then tell them to be resilient, we're actually doing additional harm. Mm, mm. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's an excellent, excellent answer. Fatima, do you want to take a run at this question? How are campuses uh, supporting resilience now? Um, I love uh, uh, current answers, and I could say that uh, I can see that uh, universities increasing their uh, workshops for um, mental health, so to support uh, students. Uh, but I also uh, would like to add that um, if we can uh, also academically support students, have services for academically that help them to uh, actually uh, manage their academic pressures, that uh, would help them to increase their resilience. What would, a, what would such an academic resilience uh, support look like? Or what's an example of one? Uh, like, um, as one of source of stress or uh, mental um, problem that the students have, um, especially in higher level, uh, their uh, pressure they have from the um, managing their academic works and how they can manage the workload and how they can <clears throat> even receive guidance from their uh, faculties. So uh, having some sort of pro programs actually facilitate uh, this part of um, stress for students that um, along with faculties would help the students in this regard. Excellent, that, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to see this. Well, let me let me add to the stage, uh, Professor Moore. Uh, what do you think? What, what what do you have to add about how campuses are supporting resilience? Yeah, I think well, I think there's two uh, sort of two dimensions that I see. So I sat in on a task force for <clears throat> institutional resilience. Um, I don't know if scare quotes are appropriate or not, um, but it, it it was interesting how first of all, how folks got selected for that task force, and second of all, the perspectives that came. Every single member of that task force, except for me, was in an administrative position. And a lot of them also came from like risk mitigation, you know, risk management roles mm -hmm. within the institution. And I, I, in all candor, probably about, you know, a, a little bit into the discussions, I was incredibly frustrated with how much the conversation focused on the organization's resilience, like the continuation of the institution itself, yeah. as opposed to actually talking about the individual human beings within the organization and how their ability to, <clears throat> to be healthier um, and to be supported by the institution itself actually contributes to the organization's health and um, and and resilience. So I I think my sense of the conversation has been that it's really been uh, pulled more towards maintenance of the institution itself uh, in service of that, and not really focused on individuals and what it is that we need um, as part of that. And then I I just simply echo what Karen has talking has been talking about um, the piece that we shared I think Brian's got it linked here um, as part of today's forum I was I was writing exactly on this issue of this approach of employee fix thyself <clears throat> as a sort of approach 
to mental health, um, which is a very limited and limiting approach in a lot of ways. And in fact, I, I think in somewhere in there, I was referencing somebody who said, you know, we're, we're taking this very cynical approach to mental health and resilience that, that basically blames the failures of a system on the individuals and just says, well, if you would just attend, um, <clears throat> you know, yoga training or mindfulness or something like that, and if you, that would just fix yourself and then that would fix us. And I think it's a bit of a cynical approach uh, to everything. So what I was trying to map out in that piece was really more of a systems approach to how do we think about what are the different elements within a system and really drawing on like organizational uh, design and human performance um, and support as part of that, but really trying to unpack like what's going on with the policies that we have and how those policies actually create disincentives for self-care in the system. Um, what should be better policies for that? How are we resourcing individuals? Um, how are we approaching job ta uh, definitions and clarifying that for people? There's all of these different systemic levers that we have that can really make it better for folks um, that aren't just about the organization itself being resilient, but it's really about how do we help the individuals within, um, how do we situate them in a much healthier work environment so that they can they can do what it is that they're there to do. Hmm. Uh, that's, that's beautifully said, um, Stephanie. I, 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 I'm nodding all, the, all throughout, and I think in, in the chat you can see people grabbing different quotes for you already. <laughs> Um, including the uh, the great employee fix thyself um, line. Um, <clears throat> before the three of you started started answering my my weird question, um, we had a question that came in from our, our friend uh, in Florida, uh, uh, Glenn McGee, and he asked us this: Is resilience macro or micro or both? And I, I think you're all saying both, really. That this is something institutions have to respond to at a caring for individuals um, and also on multiple levels, but also doing that in a structural and systematic way. Would, would that be right? I, I think so. I mean, I, so, you know, again, in that piece, Glenn, I, I was really writing about it from a very macro systemic perspective. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I think lots of folks who do work in systems engineering, um, you know, systems theory, things like that, are, are going to tend to define resilience in a, in a much more macro way. You know, Brian was talking about well, what's really the the antithesis of resilience. Uh, brittle, brittle would be that. Um, you know, you don't typically want brittle um, engineered systems. Like I'm, I'm, I used to work in engineering, so I'm thinking of airplanes as an example. Mm -hmm. um, there's multiple fail safes within those systems, so that if I, you know, a problem happens over here. It's it's your system architecture actually is not so brittle. I don't I don't know how good of a job we're actually doing right now designing against having uh, a brittle system. I think I'm seeing some institutions do some interesting things, so that that's a really good sign. Uh, but <clears throat> um, but to me, that suggests definitely a, a macro sort of approach to what resilience really means, where we're asking questions about how are we designing the system around people and around individuals to better support them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in the in the chat, Karen Costa shared a, a link to a resource, and I'll just paste it again in there, um, which is the uh, Academic Resilience Consortium. Yes. Yep. Um, so that's a that's a new resource to me, and that's really good to see. Thank you, Brian. Can I add something? I, I, I yes, I, I I think it's a both and. Um, I think that 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 systems level resilience, um, culti You know, I think of it kind of like a garden. So um, if we have healthy soil in the garden, our flowers are going to bloom. If we don't have, you know, well. If you're like me, you have really crappy soil conditions that you've never paid attention to. And then you're yelling at your flowers. Why aren't you blooming? Why aren't you blooming? Like, right. So but that's pretty that's not very bright of me. So um, <laughs> that's one of the ways that we can think about it is 
you know, the, the macro is the garden and the soil conditions. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, life's going to life and it's going to do its thing. Um, so let's focus, instead of like yelling at the flower, why aren't you blooming? Let's focus on cultivating really healthy conditions for them. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a great metaphor. Uh, as as an amateur gardener, I'm I I, I love that. I, I can just see people doing it. Why aren't you blooming? Yeah. Uh, uh, but let, let me ask a second question, and then and then let me get out of the way and let and let other people take over here. Um, there's a lot of concern in uh, the parts of higher ed that serve traditional age undergraduates. That is, people roughly 18 to 22 years old, and the concern has to do with the past four years. Uh, there's a lot of concern that students have lost uh, social skills or rather they missed an opportunity to develop social skills due to the pandemic and perhaps other cases. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety about uh, negative impacts of uh, overuse of social media. Uh, there's also a great deal of concern about how in poll after poll as well as throughout the psychiatric literature, you see younger people just having this enormously escalating mental health crisis. Um, how can colleges and universities best support this upcoming generation that seems so troubled and to need so much more help than its previous uh, generations? And you've, you've all just answered this in, in a way by talking about this great metaphor of, of the macro and the micro of, of the garden. But how else in particular can we support these students? Um, I'll dive in. So along the lines of, you know, the, the, the condition, you know, if we use this metaphor of the conditions of the or quality of the soil, um, one of my invitations to folks is uh, to this, idea, you know, the ivory tower that we are insulated from the rest of society. Like, I, I think that's been dying and dead for quite a long time. Um, I think we need to have more honest conversations with each other about um, things such as gun violence, um, racism, sexism, climate change, and their impact on our students' mental health, um, mm -hmm. and and also on our students with mental illness. I actually see those as two somewhat distinct concepts. Um, how are we supporting mm -hmm. students with mental mm -hmm. illness, right. and how are we promoting mental health? And mm -hmm. I don't know how we can you know show up in a meeting as as scholars and educators and talk about mental health and not right. talk about gun violence. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we've seen some, you know, horrific tragedies, not, you know, obviously outside of higher education, but on campuses, uh, too many, too many to, to even fathom. And how, how are we expecting our, our students and faculty and staff to teach and learn when they're terrified? And, um, you know, the, the other challenges I mentioned, and the, other, the obvious elephant in the room, Brian, that I know um, you care deeply about is, is climate change. And a big part of my work is talking to faculty about bringing climate change and climate action into the classroom. I think um, when there's a sense that the, the grown-ups in the room, um, our students are grown-ups as well, but when there's a, a sense that our, our leaders are ignoring um, this you know, species threatening, you know, species level threat, um, that doesn't bode for a sense of security. Um, and so much of mental health health is tied to a sense of our ability to feel safe. Um, so the, that is coming up for me, um, the, just constantly making sure that we're naming all these issues um, and taking a more proactive stance as a, you know, as a collective of higher educators to say, this is impacting our mission. We can't teach and learn when we are terrified. We can't teach and learn I mean, I'm sure our schools in LA open today. I don't know um, because there's these massive floods. So that we're seeing, you know, constant. I don't need to tell you, Brian, but that that's something that comes up constantly for me. You, you remind me of um, Colorado College, which um, has a, a program for undergraduates to live off campus in ecological housing and to do some work on climate change. And the, the president of Colorado College tells me that students who go through this program report their mental health improved as a result of it. And so I, I've been going around from campus to campus saying, you all should be doing this. This sounds like a no brainer, but thank you. That's a, that's a great answer. Uh, Fatima, uh, not to anticipate your answer, but I'm curious, is there anything we can do in terms of instructional design to make the uh, educational technology and the learning experience 
you know, less frustrating and, and less painful and to, to make it cause less psychological stress. Yeah, I wanted to say that I'm looking from the uh, instructional design part to mental health, student mental health. I love uh, Karen answers and the trauma things that she um, explained, and I really agreed with that. But uh, from instructional design perspective, and um, the students, every daily life they have with this part of their um, education is that um, they are, have a lot of workload uh, to manage as a student and they have the personal um, living. So um, the, with their um, workload, you can add the learning system management, they are working with that and the uh, course structure, they are working with that from faculty perspective part and, um, and the technology platforms um, and I we, we said the content part, they all make uh, students that um, feel upset from um, their mental health. So uh, from instructional design perspective, what we can add is to um, manage course content and workload and help them to better on the, navigate uh, where they need to start and where they need to finish and also fostering their active learning uh, in an engagement with the course content and mm -hmm. um, besides this having a user-friendly environment help them to a little bit uh, increase and decrease their cognitive load and help them to um, uh, mentally being health from from to support the students mental health thank you thank you i can see the dissertation wheels turning excellent <laughs> excellent <laughs> Stephanie, did, did you want to add anything more yeah i think um ironically to kind of flip more to the micro <laughs> <laughs> after just talking about macro. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm thinking a little bit about, um, there were some claims made about the relationship between online learning and mental health that were extremely dubious. And so um, I worked with Michael Barber and George Valencianos to go out and actually mm -hmm. read the literature because, you know, we know the, the research on online learning really well. And I was like, I have never seen claims about relationships or whatnot. So we went out to review what we could. Um, and it was fascinating in many regards, including um, that all but one that we could find um, postdated the pandemic. Um, so every study out there was situated in the context of the pandemic and yet failed to account for the pandemic as a variable. <laughs> when they looked at this, yeah, it was really bad. It's actually a pretty bad indictment of research uh, if, if, I, if I dig much further. But um, there were a few uh, in the studies that we looked at where, um, well, there's some other, other features, I should say, of, the, of that body of work that were really interesting. One of it was that in the studies that were better done, they actually, in their lit reviews, talked about a trend over time of student stress and mental health increasingly getting worse. And their, cita their citations predate the pandemic, right? So there are things that we are doing in higher education that are contributing to student stress. And I think we need to talk about what are some of those things and how do we start to um, counteract that. So for example, a common thing that, that we hear from students and that gets reported in some of these studies is that class expectations and time demands regularly exceed their capacity to actually meet the class expectations. Um, I feel like that's a really tactical, tangible, clear item that we could take yeah. action on yeah. where we say, okay, how, how accurate is your estimate of how much time a student is spending on class readings, activities, things like that, where you may think that they should be spending, uh, be able to get everything done, let's say in 10 hours a week outside of class, but really the demand on a student is uh, more like 20 hours a week. And when you start to stack 
stack that up across four and five classes, wow. um, the time demand is 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 physically too much, right? Like students mm -hmm. feel like they can't actually do what's being asked of them. We're not doing a great job of estimating time on task. So mm -hmm. I think that's something that, um, independent of some of these externalities, is a spot where we can start and say how 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 good do we how well are we evaluating the actual load of a class and where and how do we need to adjust some of these time loads um, for students so that their learning load is actually a manageable load. Um, a couple of other things that some of those authors referred to as well as integration of support services directly into online. I think too mm -hmm. often mm -hmm. online is treated like a, or uh, blended to some extent too, but I think online gets treated like a collection of classes or a curriculum that, that delivering online learning just means delivering online classes. And yet we don't even treat on-campus education that same way. On-campus on education is, is um, theorized in a much more systemic way. You know, education doesn't just comprise going to classes. You've also got financial aid services, access to counseling, job support development, you know, all of that. So I think taking a more systemic approach of what we're thinking about around how online learning initiatives are conceived and the integration of supports for students into that so that it's just embedded in the infrastructure. Access to services or support is, is every bit as easy as it is to the library. Um, and then there were also references to disruption of routines. Um, so when we do start talking about like the pandemic or um, uh, disruption to schooling because like wildfires in Canada and people are displaced or things like that. What students actually talked about as being most disruptive for them was disruption to their routines, to sleep routines, eating and exercise in particular. And so those, the researchers in those papers were really focused on how can I support my students in either reestablishing their routines or developing some new routines to help them with their exercise or sleep or whatnot that, that then contributes to their overall health and mental health. That Okay, well, first of all, this sounds like someone who just wrote a great paper on the subject because that, that is that is so much, so much information and so much research on this. I, 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 I think you can you can see all kinds of support for what you just said also in, in, in the chat. And I, right. I, I right. thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, also in the chat, uh, Karen just shared a calculator uh, from Louisiana State University about time on task. Um, I, I, I love the way you're you're giving us ways of, of universities and colleges to restructure how they do academic teaching, but also individual faculty uh, to rethink this, as well as students to think. All right, what am I, what am I actually ex you know, experiencing? Is this, um, you know, how, you know, how hard is this? Let me let me stop throwing questions out because people have great questions instead uh, coming up. And here's one from our friend Donald Clark. And Donald, he's in the UK, but I have no idea where in the world he is because he's a great traveler. So I'm just going to assume he's in the UK for now. And he asks, can AI chatbots help partly with the problem? Young people suffer in silence. They don't go to parents, faculty, administrators, or teachers. But AI chatbot psychologists get 3.2 million hits a day. And he points also to Replica. I would add character.ai. So what do you th what do you think? I mean, can AI chatbots help with all in this? I'm going to get myself in trouble. Um, I have a, a tool that was shared with me. I'm going to put it in the chat. It's called... Um, a lot of people, uh, I'm going to split the room here, I'm sure, but um, it's called Pi. It's an, it's a, it's an AI. It's specifically geared to, um, I guess I would say it's like a, a life coaching support geared AI. So it's tone, it, it's been mm -hmm. trained mm -hmm. to, it's not, you know, it's, it's a, a it's war, a warmer chat GPT. It was introduced to me in a, a group I'm a part of outside of how you're at a women's group. Um, and a therapist actually recommended it as a tool. I've tried it. I've used it. Um, it's actually when I'm, I, I tried it before a presentation I had to give and I was a bundle of nerves and I started talking to Pi about my nerves and it was giving very sound advice for uh, how I might deal with those nerves. So 
Um, there's a part of me that initially wants to scream into the void, like AI chatbot, like, no. <laughs> and um, so I'm going to acknowledge that part of me. And I, you know, I'm thinking about how can we get each other into spaces with our fellow humans? Um, and I've had this really positive experience with this, um, you know, coaching support AI. So um, yeah, pi.ai. Um, so maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a that's a great resource. I'm sure. See, we're going to lose the whole discussion right now. Everyone's going to be off on. No, pod. we can't go to A. <laughs> we can't do that. We can't do that. Multitasking. Uh, so thank you, thank you. And the, in in the chat, uh, Donald says the here emphasizes that partly was a, a key part of this. Um, oh, what do you think, uh, Fatima or uh, Stephanie? What do you think about using AI for this? Fatima, uh, go right ahead. <laughs> Um, let me add, at first uh, add uh, something to the question for mental health for instructional design part. So uh, the a study we did for a literature review to found the source of mental fatigue for uh, students. Uh, we came with some uh, categories uh, from the literature that. Um, it was, we could categorize them in five categories. One is what, about the learner and uh, the, and it, their characteristics. And the second one was about the task characteristics. Um, the yeah. task, I mean, the uh, academic task that they should do within the course and the course characteristics itself. And then the environment characteristics, uh, which we the divided in um, three uh, environment, the physical one, the online environment, uh, and the, the technology part of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last one, it was uh, others, as Dr. Uh, Moore mentioned that it was about the pandemic and the lockdown that they measured how that one uh, contributed to a student's mental fatigue and how that one changed the routines and uh, for a students, uh, but for the uh, uh, the one that I want to point is uh, we should not forget about the physical environment that pandemic uh, put us in a uh, physical environment that we had to uh, do both our uh, same um, personal life and also learning in the same environment, yeah. and uh, it increased uh, students' mental fatigue. Um, and for answering this question, I should mention that as an international student in the United States, I think that really uh, help us. And I acknowledge that uh, it's really help other students, specifically uh, helping with writing. And uh, it, it decreased the time that we could put for an effort we should put for every part of um, writing. So it, it helped us to manage that part. So I, I agree that it helped. Well, thank you. That's a great, Ed, by the way, Fatima, we're gonna circle back to your last point about international students in just a few minutes. <laughs> That's really helpful. Uh, Stephanie, did you, did you want to add anything to our AI? discussion about this? I, I think the only thing that I would add in here is that, um, and, and this may be a bit ironic for your podcast, Brian, but I really, I really hesitate to get into questions of, you know, um, um, could something do X? Well, I think that's always a much more complex question than that, right? Like, um, could we use a technology for that? Yes, but I think what that means is that that's incumbent upon us to actually try to study it and understand the nuances and the implications of that. Like, is that effective for particular needs, but not as effective for other needs? Um, what are some of the features or variables of that that make it more effective or less effective or even detrimental? And I, right now, we just don't have a robust enough body of research I think we will go back to that question and really answer that meaningfully. And yeah. so to my mind, that's a call to the research community. 
um, mm -hmm. to say, you know, we need to engage in asking questions like this. Um, I know I've got colleagues in psychology who have definitely been exploring that um, even before, you know, chat GPT and others came out, like using um, Alexa or other types of devices to explore, like, for seniors who are at home and lonely, does this help them um, in some way or help them with particular tasks, you know, or things like that. Um, but right now, I feel like trying to answer that question is a bit nascent without having better research that can really help us unpack some of the nuance around it. Mm, mm, mm. That's a really, really good point. I mean, this is so new and, and, and the technology, I mean, that is, is so new. Uh, it's developing so quickly uh, the, the time yeah. uh, if i could forgive me for you know, the time to task for producing uh research on this will will we'll take yeah. time the, the I mean, we have, uh, sorry um I'm, I'm noticing don's that we've had these have been around a long time i think i think that's a really important point to underscore here is that you know we're talking about some of these technologies like they're new but i think we can also go back to a lot of the research around um like intelligent tutors and some of the other systems like that and start to learn from that the problem is most of that research has really been focused more on student learning as the holy grail really that rather than like mental health or something like that so i i still think that there's there's a gap that needs to be filled in here but there's a richer body of work to build upon and draw upon than I think our current cacophonous discourse might lead us to believe. Well, it, it is it is quite a cacophony, and we're 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 doing our best to try and to try and get some improve the signal to noise ratio on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, three, uh, and thank you, Donald, for the for the great question. Uh, and folks, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a, a Q and A box question. I'm going to give you another example right now. Uh, we have another one from the awesome Ithaca SNR group. This is uh, Elmira Zhangzhou, uh, and her question has to do with international students. Um, oops, excuse me. Um, so what trends or insights have you observed in your research and practice regarding the mental health challenges faced by international students? So I'll begin that, but I, I hope F uh, Fatima picks up the baton here. <laughs> Um, when we review the research on mental health and online learning, a vast majority of those were outside of U.S. and U.K. So a lot of those were in, um, you know, however international gets defined mm -hmm. here at Ithaca. So that's going to be non-U.S. Um, so uh, a lot of those studies were outside. And I will say that despite methodological issues and a lot of other issues that we could get into and debate with over se about 75% of those papers. Um, the, the under, I, the impression that we got and actually the way that we ended up writing our article and our summary on that was that it was very clear across paper, every single paper that students were struggling to navigate a period of profound loneliness, isolation, and loss. The sense of loss that pervaded the literature and student responses completely separate from any discussion on online learning. Um, it just hung over that literature review and even our own effect of it as we were going through it. Um, and so I do think that there's a, a widespread, widespread sense of loss. And, and I've been doing work with the State Department here, doing talks with foreign embassies on online learning. Mental health has increasingly been coming up as part of those conversations with folks asking questions around how, what are strategies that we could use with the students who we have who are coming to us remotely in some form to better support their mental health, you know, and some of those contexts were like Lebanon where they're dealing with serious civil unrest. Um, uh, I spent a week over in Cambodia with folks talking about, uh, um, supposedly about online learning, but really the shift focused more to economic complexities there and how students are navigating that and what's the role in helping with that. So my sense of the trend line that you're asking about is that this is globally shared. There may be specific contextual nuances like civil rest here, war there, 
Um, climate change impact there. Like I, I had a meeting with Bangladesh where they were more concerned about that. Um, but broadly, I'm seeing this as a widely shared concern. Well, thank you. Thank you. I was I was really afraid you were going to mention when you're talking about different nations that you're going to talk about Canada. And I would have to make some kind of cruel joke about Canada deciding not to have any more international students. But but uh, let, let me let me step aside from that. That's a great answer, Stephanie. The team, uh, Karen, did you want to add anything more to the international student question? I'd like to hear from Fatima first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as an international student came to United States, I could say that the journey I had, uh, it was um, lots of um, mental health and well-being issues I had, but the most part I should say that uh, I'm not talking about the online one, but the, in being in campus mm -hmm. is about the culture that I uh, should understand the culture and how to communicate. And um, there is a lot of, there are a lot of uncertainty that you should answer or you should uh, face to those uncertainly and uh, those all add to your mental health with uh, being a student and go through for every courses do you have and you should um, understand in another language in another way of uh, uh, instruction is different from my home country. So those are added to my mental and to my well-being. Uh, and um, how university support, I should say that uh, couldn't find any uh, actually um, source or center that I could go there and uh, talk about my um, issues, but mainly my uh, professors faculty in the department um, helped me to go through to for each of those um, problem I had. But um, yeah, it, from international student, every specific or it, any details you can think uh, is normal, but could be a very uh, mental health issue. I think Karen can add more because it's like a trauma being immigrant in another country. Wow. Yeah, and Brian, what I what I want to add to that is that faculty piece of faculty success and faculty well being. And I, you know, one of my arguments is that teaching in higher ed is increasing increasingly relational work. And um, I think one of the things um, that Stephanie and I have talked about is research on cl online class sizes and. Um, so that's another example of like a, a systems level approach mm -hmm. um, to supporting faculty and student mental health. So the size of our online classes generally just does not match up to what we know about, um, you know, works in online learning. Um, I'm here and I'm, I'm hearing students getting <laughs> faculty getting like I, I heard at one point during the pandemic, somebody had a thousand students in their online course. Um, and there's this idea like, oh, we can just keep adding more. Um, and in some ways, those courses require even more um, presence and even more intentional support. Um, our faculty, uh, we love our staff and our faculty are those who are gonna spend the most time with our students as Fatima is mentioning that that's who you were, that's who was supporting you at, as an international student. So um, I, you know, I've seen other mixed data on class sizes because if we have a smaller class size at an institution that is less diverse, where sometimes um, students of color are reporting that that is actually detrimental. Um, but I, you know, I think the encouragement here is I, it seems like the, another one of these things we're not allowed to talk about in higher ed, but like, let's mm -hmm. talk about class sizes and course loads and let's set faculty up so that they can actually do this relational work, break through this loss and loneliness, help our students um, and design really effective classes. Um, and it's very difficult to do that with the, you know, very common class sizes and course loads. A thousand students in one class. Um, friends, I, I, I'm conscious of, of, of several things right now. Uh, one is that we only have five minutes left, um, which which is heartbreaking. 
because the other thing I'm conscious of is that we've just waded into some very, very powerful uh, deep water here. Um, in, in the chat, uh, we've had discussion, are we talking about isolation, loss, angst, and well, me, and it, it seems like what you're describing is, I, I think the mental health crisis might, might be a good term to describe this, uh, and not just for our rising students, but also for faculty and staff. And you've outlined so many ways that campuses can respond um, and should respond. The, the, the me, let me ask this uh, as a way of, of, of helping us grapple with all of it. If you could magically transform one institution to take this seriously, you know, we're going to hire Karen Costa as VP of mental health. We're going to put Stephanie Moore as dean of students. We're going to have Fatima leading professional development with an army at her back. Well, all, all of this, all of this. And you let that play for five years. What would that institution look like? You know, how would that be different from the schools that we have now? There's a lot to tackle there in three minutes. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to, it's, I think it's easy to talk about the students and necessary to talk about the students, but I'm going to talk about um, the faculty and staff side of this. First of all, I think that the way that that would look is we would have um, much higher retention numbers among faculty and staff people not retiring early um, or not taking as much leave. Um, like if you want to drill down to metrics, <laughs> how you would know if you're building a healthier system. Um, and I think that that we would have um, faculty who feel like they can actually spend more time focusing on supporting their students and, and actually focusing on the teaching and learning um, uh, of individuals. And look, I, like I said, there's more than we can cover here. So there's a lot to unpack even in just that statement. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, I cannot, behind the scenes as a journal editor and as a faculty member, I have seen so many people um, step out of academia. Um, of publishing, of deciding, you know what, I can't do this, it's too much, what's being asked of me is too much, the stress and the demands of it are becoming too much, and so we're losing people. Um, and so I think that's one of the significant ways in which an institution would change in that five year is that it would actually retain people. And those people, frankly, would probably be more productive. So it's, it's sort uh -huh. of inverting that relationship, like what Karen was talking about. You know, we're doing things that are inadvertently making it less productive. And I think you could you could flip that around. Great answer. Great answer. Very concrete answer, too, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. Fatima, Karen, what would an institution look like with you at the helm? I'm going to be really succinct and say I, I was, I'm right there with you, Stephanie. Um, faculty working conditions are student learning conditions. And um, I would like to specifically make um, a plea for cluster hires. Um, to not only hire folks from marginalized communities, but to have a built-in support system so that we can keep them there. Um, there's That's a whole other conversation, but I'll, I'll be quiet. I put that info in the chat. Oh, that's great. That's great. By, by the way, both Stephanie and Karen, you've been crazy generous in the chat. This is, this is a whole bibliography. Uh, friends in the chat, by the way, before Fatima gets to speak, if you have... Uh, any uh, objection to me uh, anonymizing and posting this chat, just to let me know. Otherwise, uh, I think this is a, a rich, rich record and I would really like to share it. Please, Fatima, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to add from a student perspective and uh, I could uh, say that um, in five next year, we could see them uh, Mm, environments that actually mentally uh, men, friendly men, uh, friendly is uh, for uh, students and uh, could help them to uh, manage their uh, workload and their personal life together. So uh, right now what uh, we do as uh, students is most of the time working on uh, our uh, it's the, our university uh, workload, and it's really not really um, 
have time to focus on personal life. So maybe in five years we can do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's 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 a great. Thank you. That that's a really good answer. I'm especially glad that you spoke from the point of view of students. Mm. In, in in the chat, Daniel Campa, or El, El Campo referred to caring institutions, and I, I love the way that the three of you have just identified not just in the answer to my question, but in this whole hour, you've identified pathways by which colleges and universities can actually be caring institutions. The, the, we are out of time, and I, I have to wrap things up with a great deal of regret. Uh, you've all been fantastic. Well, what's the best way to keep up with each of you? Uh, first of all, Karen, uh, should we just go to uh, your main website, or what's the best way? Sure. Um, my my website's 100faculty.com. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, a little less active on Blue Sky, no longer on the old Twitter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Fatima, how do we keep up with you? Uh, it's my uh, university email address. It's the best way to contact me. Thank you. And it's in my website as well. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And Stephanie, how about you? How do we keep up with the, with your all of your work? Well, I'm gonna first. I'm gonna plug Fatima. You can also find her at AERA. So <laughs> I'm just so excited about her joining our profession and the work that she's doing. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm no longer on Twitter. I love Mastodon, actually. Um, I'm kind of geeking out in that space, but I'm also minimizing my social online presence more. But probably the easiest way to tap me is via LinkedIn. So very good, very yeah. good. Well, thank you all for tapping into us for this past hour. Uh, it's it's really been just a, a conversation. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and I, I hope each of you have a wonderful week and year ahead. Thank you again. You as well. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, thank you so everybody. Much. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you. But don't leave yet, friends. Uh, let me just point you to uh, where things are headed next for our forum. Um, thank you all for for really good questions and uh, and a comment box, a chat box that was just on fire. If you want to keep talking about these issues about about angst and supporting institutions, sorry, supporting institutions as well as individuals, we can keep talking about this on on social media. Just use the hashtag FTTE. Here is how you can find me on Twitter, on Mastodon with Stephanie, on Threads, and Blue Sky, uh, and of course on my blog. Um, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, including those about mental health, just go to our archive at tinyurl.com slash fdfarchive. If you want to look ahead to our other topics, including mental health, but also college sports, 100 years of educational technology, the Department of Education, and still more, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. Thank you again for being with us for a very, very powerful hour. Uh, I really, really appreciate all this. I hope this has helped you all. Um, I hope all of you are doing well, that you're safe and sound, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>